We're beginning today's show in Bolivia, where former President Evo Morales's political party, MAS, is claiming victory in Sunday's presidential election. The results of the twice postponed election have not been officially announced, but the centrist former President Carlos Mesa conceded defeat Monday as exit polls show Luis Arce has won over half of the vote, giving him an outright win. If confirmed, it will put the Socialist Party back in power, putting an end to the far right government which overthrew Evo Morales in a coup in November 2019. Protests have rocked Bolivia for months now, calling out the right-wing government's use of military and police repression and violence against indigenous communities. At a news conference Monday in Buenos Aires, Argentina, former President Evo Morales responded to the election's outcome. Sooner or later, we are going to return to Bolivia. That's not up for debate. And yes, there are many processes which are part of a dirty war and so many lies. Bolivian brothers and sisters, with experience and with Lucho president, once again will bring Bolivia forward, will pick Bolivia up. In a short time, Bolivia will once again be enshrouded in economic growth like we had. This is the only political movement, the movement towards socialism, the political instrument for sovereignty for the people, that has a vision for the country, has a program. That's why we won easily. That's former Bolivian President Evo Morales. This is President-elect Luis Arce of the MAS party responding to the election results. We have recovered our soul. We have recovered the mysticism of this process. The people have made this possible with their discipline. We recovered this process of change for all. That's President-elect Luis Arce speaking to journalist Ali Vargas, who joins us now from La Paz, Bolivia. We welcome you to Democracy Now!, Ali. Can you talk about the stunning victory um, that has come outright after Sunday's election? Explain who Arce is and what this means for the MAS party and for the ousted um, Bolivian president, Evo Morales. Uh, thank you for having me on and helping to shine a light on what's going on here in Bolivia. This is an extraordinary election. In 2019, Evo Morales uh, won by a margin of 10 percent, or just over 10 percent. And now we have a margin of over 20 percent, um, with which the left is ahead. So it's an extraordinary election. And Luis Arce, uh, I think you mentioned at the beginning of the show, is a hand-picked successor of Evo Morales. That's because he was the economy minister for almost all of the period, almost all of the past 14 years of Evo Morales' government, in which Bolivia went from being the region's poorest country into its fastest growing economy. Even uh, sort of more right-wing outlets such as the Financial Times, the BBC, institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, uh, talked about a Bolivian miracle during Evo Morales' period for the past... Uh, before Evo Morales was for the past six years, Bolivia was the fastest growing economy in the region. So I think what we'll, the mass will want to be doing is picking up where they left off. However, a huge challenge now will be the economic crisis caused both by COVID-19, the lockdown measures, but also the, a series of neoliberal reforms, privatizations, paralyzations of state projects that was taking place before the pandemic here and has carried on since. So um, the mass, the movement towards socialism, the left, the key, key challenge is rebuilding the economy as they did in 2005. We have to remember that um, Evo Morales and Luis Arce took power in 2005, swept to power on the wave of popular protest in which former president Carlos Mesa and current sort of centrist neoliberal candidate um, was overthrown. And Bolivia was in a dire economic crisis at the time. When Carlos Mesa was president, he was taking out IMF loans to pay public sector salaries, to pay teachers' salaries. And out of those, uh, out of that disaster, actually, Luis Arce built what he calls the social, communitarian, um, productive economic model based on the nationalization of natural resources and strategic industries, and then using those profits to invest in infrastructure, public services, uh, social benefits 
for the people. So he'll be looking to rebuild that model that was, uh, you could say, destroyed this past year under uh, under the current Barak government led by Hanina Anyas. And uh, Oli Vargas, I wanted to ask you specifically, you mentioned Carlos uh, Mesa. Uh, he was the uh, the right-wing candidate, but could there have been a more clear choice for the people of Bolivia, given the fact that Mesa had previously been both a vice president and president uh, before Evo Morales came to power? Could you talk about Mesa's record that the voters uh, had to uh, had an ability to judge uh, when they went to the polls? Yeah, in in some ways, Bolivians were were kind of lucky insofar as the two main candidates in the election had both been in power uh, pretty recently within the living memory of most voters. As I said, beginning Carlos Mesa governed, where he took he was elected as vice president in two thousand and two, together with the widely hated former president Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada, who fled to Miami in 2003 after trying to privatize the country's natural gas, uh, and after carrying out uh, a series of, of massacres in the indigenous city of El Alto. He flees to Miami. Carlos Mesa takes power in 2003. And 2003 to 2005 is a period of complete paralysis in Bolivia, because Carlos Mesa pledges to not use repression uh, to not mobilize the military against protesters as his president, uh, presidential partner did. However, he, he insists on the plan of privatizing the country's natural gas and uh, exporting it through uh, the port of Chile. And that, uh, that, of course, meant that the social movements, uh, some of which led by Evo Morales, continued, continued their general strikes, continued popular uprising, and the country became ungovernable, and the economic crisis became extreme. As I said, the IMF were brought in to... IMF loans have been taken out to pay for the basic costs of the state, not for investment, but to pay public sector salaries. Um, as I said, the basic costs of the state. So Bolivia was an incredibly uh, disastrous moment in the two years in which Carlos Mesa ruled, uh, with the backing, I should say, of the United States. So people have that in their memories, but people also, you know, lived through, experienced the past 14 years under Evo Morales, in which uh, the size of the economy tripled, the incomes of most people uh, tripled at the very least. For so those on minimum wage, it uh, skyrocketed even further. Unemployment was the lowest in the region, um, and Bolivia was the had the highest rate of GDP growth. Uh, than any other country in the region. So people have both of those experiences somewhat recently. So it was uh, Bolivians had, an inf had, had the information with which to make a choice, and 52, 53% of the country voted for Eva Morales' party, the movement towards socialism. On Monday, you posted a short video on Twitter, writing, quote, I want to denounce that Bolivian coup supporters tried to assault me just now while I filmed at a polling station in Ciudad Satellite. They know they've lost the vote, so they resort to violence against journalists. This is how um, Camacho and Mesa supporters operate. This is a clip. <laughs> I have the right to film. I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist. Sorry, friend. I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist. And this man... This is violence on behalf of the right-wing groups. So can you talk about what happened to you, Ali, but also what um, Janine Añez tried to do? She herself said she wouldn't be running for president. She other, uh, got others to pull out of the race so that the other side, um, so that they could the, consolidate uh, and have a chance to win. But even still, Arce won outright uh, with over half the vote. Uh, yeah, starting with uh, what happened to me on Election Day, I think— what I experienced on Election Day was uh, was a microcosm of what this country has gone through this past year. I started my day uh, following Luis Arce, where he went to vote in the middle-class neighborhood of Miraflores in La Paz, at which um, 
Those lining up to vote will be incredibly aggressive, challenging us in to, to a fight, uh, throwing eggs, throwing water. Um, but okay, tensions, polarization. We left there and we went to Ciudad Satellite with the president of the Senate, uh, the mass, who belongs to the mass, Eva Copa, when she went to vote. And when we arrived at the polling station, there was a large group of people already there who were not in the queue to vote, who immediately began being incredibly aggressive, began uh, chanting a number of things. And I began to film what they were chanting. And it was at that point when uh, two men began trying to take my uh, filming equipment. I had a press credential around my neck that I tried to pull that off. I was punched in the chest. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and, and that sort of hostility continued while Eva Kopp was voting and as we left. But then what happened at the end of the day? We got the exit polls to sh and what we found out was that the country doesn't belong to that violent far-right minority. The country belongs to, the, to, to Bolivia's social movements, to the popular movements who fight for equality, who fight for democracy, liberty, for national sovereignty against US interference. And I think the, the fact that the mass would win, this, the fact that the left would win this election has been very clear for a number of months. And that's why the, uh, those who support the current regime have increasingly turned to violence. And another sign of desperation from, you know, for a long time now has been the pressure on the other right-wing candidates to step down in, so as to consolidate the right-wing vote behind Carlos Mesa. As you mentioned, Henny Nanias, she, she declared a candidacy in January, despite pledging not to, and then had to withdraw a candidacy just a few weeks before the elections. She didn't do it in time, so on election day when I went to vote, she was still on the ballot. But any votes for her counted as a sport ballot. And that was, there was a huge amount of pressure, both from the regime, from uh, the mainstream media, even, C, even um, CNN presenter Fernando del Rincón joined in, calling on the other sort of smaller right-wing candidates to step down because it's the only way in which the uh, pro-coup candidate, Carlos Mesa, could have any chance of uh, forcing the mass into a second round. But even if they had all united, the, it wouldn't have made a difference. Luis Arce won. Well, there's been two exit polls. One shows he won with 52%. Another shows that he's won with 53%. So... It, the victory of the mass is overwhelming. Even with the unity of all the right-wing forces, uh, the mass would have still won. So it shows us as well, actually, what happened in 2019, when it was, uh, I think, in a number of U.S. Uh, outlets, uh, mainstream media outlets, it was portrayed as a sort of a popular uprising that people have rejected Evo Morales. Well, what people were they talking about? They weren't talking about the 53% of the country that voted yesterday. Well, the people they're referring to is um, a whiter, middle-class, upper-class elite based in the, in the inner circles of the big cities who, yes, did protest in large numbers against Evo Morales. But actually, uh, the voices of the majority of the Bolivian people in the indigenous rural areas, in the working-class areas of the cities, those voices were completely ignored. And they, those areas never joined in the protests against Evo Morales. And it's those areas that have now taken back power uh, after voting for the mass and after winning, uh, taking back the country. And uh, Oli Vargas, I wanted to ask you about the situation with the military. Obviously, the military uh, was able to force uh, Evo Morales from power uh, uh, back then. Uh, what is your sense of where the military is right now? Are they going to accept this result? Or do you expect uh, increasing, will the new government expect increasing uh, confrontation with the military? Or will it be an attempt to remove military commanders by the new president? Well, that's a very interesting question. Throughout uh, the past year, under Añez's government, there's actually been a reorganization of the military to further entrench the sort of right-wing forces into, into the top brass. There's been a number of promotions, illegal promotions, I might add, because in Bolivia, military promotions have to be approved by the legislature. And because the legislature is elected, the mass has a majority in there, and they rejected these promotions because they were political moves. 
they're placing the most right-wing, the most pro-US, the most corrupt sections of the military and promoting them into, uh, into positions of generals, etc. So what's going to happen now? Obviously, uh, none of us know. But something very interesting happened yesterday in that the, um, the, the top military general, Sergio Arellana, who is one of the most right-wing figures within the military and who was promoted to that position by Anya's government, he released a, a, quite a bizarre public letter attacking the, the current regime for supposedly insulting the military at some event. Apparently the interior minister uh, referred in a, in a derogatory manner to, to some ranks of the military. But what this means really is he's, he, he's looking for a reason looking for something with which to distance himself from the current government so as to curry favour with the mass, with the left. And that shows the strength of the victory in that the armed sections of the state that turned against Evan Morales now feel that they have to swim with the tide, swim with the popular tide that is so overwhelming at this point. It speaks to the power and the sort of momentum behind the left here in Bolivia. Going forward, it's going to be incredibly difficult. It's clear that there needs to be a reorganization, at least on some level within the military. There's, I said earlier, I mentioned earlier that there's been a reorganization, a number of right-wing figures being promoted. There's a, num there's a huge base of support for the mass within the military, and those people are incredibly upset about the promotions that happened a few months ago. So I'm sure those factions of the military will want now to, uh, to have their place at the top. But in this transitional period between the coup government and the restoration of democracy, when Luis Arce takes power, the, the mass will have to depend on the military as it's currently constituted to not carry out a second coup. That's a concern, obviously, um, that if they alienate the military too much, then there could be even more violence between now and sort of early December, when Luis Arce officially takes power. Will the military be held accountable for massacres that took place of indigenous people and their supporters during this brief period of the coup? The, and uh, uh, Henin uh, Añez herself, will she be held accountable? And then what about the return of Evo Morales to Bolivia, Ali? Absolutely. That's been a key demand from day one of the popular movements that that are the mass that form the coalition that is the movement towards socialism. It's justice for the massacres of uh, Sencatra El Alto, Sacaba Cochabamba, Pedregales La Paz, Yapacaní Santa Cruz. And they, they've got three key figures they want, they're looking at at the moment. Añez herself, the interior minister Arturo Murillo, who ordered the massacres, and defense minister Fernando López, as well as some of the uh, generals who were there on the ground, as well, actually, um, mass lawmakers have been filing criminal charges against some of the generals who were coordinating with far-right paramilitary groups during the coup, such as the Resistencia Juvenil Cochala, sort of a motorbike gang that was used, that was working with the police to repress indigenous protests uh, just after the coup in November. So I think that uh, Luis Sarce and the mass and all the candidates of the mass have been very clear, even Evan Morales himself, that the mass is not looking to take revenge, is not looking to uh, polarize society once again. But there will be uh, justice for the people who, who gave their lives um, just after the coup in the fight for democracy. So uh, that's a key demand, justice for the massacres. Ali Vargas, I want to thank you for being with us from La Paz, Bolivia, with Casa Chun News. And I wanted to bring in for a moment um, uh, Leonardo Flores, uh, who is the Latin America campaign coordinator of Code Pink, who was part of an election uh, observer delegation that was in Bolivia for these elections. Leonardo, your observations about what happened and the significance. Can you put the significance of this mass victory, this socialist victory in Bolivia? Um, in the context of what's happening in Latin America today. Yes, thank you for having me on, Amy. First of all, I would say that my delegation witnessed a free and fair vote, very few irregularities, certainly no trends at a national level in terms of irregularities. Um, so this is a huge, huge victory, not just for the Bolivian people, but for democracy in general. And it's a blow against uh, neoliberalism and fascism in this country. 
in terms of the broader context, uh, certainly we, are, we have upcoming elections next year in Ecuador and in Chile. There's already talk of kind of a new pink wave coming to Latin America. That pink wave refers to a period in the early 2000s when progressive governments took power everywhere, everywhere from Brazil to Argentina to Venezuela and in other places. Uh, and you mentioned the pink tide. Clearly, the, uh, the pink tide had uh, um, tremendous setbacks over the last uh, decade or so in places like uh, Brazil, Ecuador, per, uh, Peru, uh, Argentina. Uh, what gives you a sense that this, what happened in Bolivia uh, this week is, uh, is an indication that the right-wing governments that have been coming to power in many of these countries can be turned back? Well, in the past year, we've seen massive protests in Ecuador, in Colombia, in, in Chile, of course. And here in Bolivia, the fact that so many people turned out on the streets over the summer, hundreds of thousands, that's what really, they, that was it, that was what led them to set the date for the elections, to fix the date for the elections. And I think that's going to inspire people around the region, and it's going to show them that people's power really can overcome these neoliberal and fascist governments that have taken power over the past five or six years in Latin America. But another thing that we have to mention also is really the role played by the OAS in this coup last year uh, and in destabilizing all of Latin America, particularly during the tenure of Luis Almagro, the current secretary general of the OAS. And, can you and what do you see as the Trump administration's uh, uh, attitude now with the, with the results in Bolivia? Well, to be honest, I don't think the Trump administration is going to be, pay be paying much attention to Bolivia. Uh, their attention in Latin America is based mostly, exclu almost exclusively on Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. And that has to do a lot with the vote in Florida with expats from Venezuela and Cuba who have donated a lot of money and can turn out the vote in Florida, which is obviously a very key state in the upcoming elections. And the significance of the role of the United States in the coup that ousted um, uh, the Bolivian president, Evo Morales, who will soon be returning to Bolivia? Well, that's a, a very important role played by the United States. So the USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, has been funding, uh, you know, Bolivian groups, Bolivian right-wing groups, since the early 2000s. And in particular, we, we know that, because of WikiLeaks, we know that the U.S. Embassy in Bolivia had an eye on Evo Morales way before he became president, when he was a social leader, when he was a union leader. And they identified him as a possible person that could coalesce the masses, coalesce the bases and the different social movements in the country, and eventually came to power. They were certainly right about that. But one of the other things they did was to come up with a plan to undermine Morales. And that plan was put in effect basically in, in 2019 uh, with the help of the OAS, which played a key role, as I said before, uh, through, through Luis Almagro, the secretary general. The OAS basically put in a narrative in the media in Bolivia that there had been a fraud in the elections. Later, we find out from CEPR, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, and MIT analysts and many others, that there was no such fraud, that the OAS result was the OAS analysis was completely flawed. Uh, for that reason, Code Pink is calling for Luis Almagro to resign. Uh, if people want to see, you know, to jo join that call, go to codepink.org slash OAS. Well, we want to thank you so much, Leonardo Flores, for joining us, Latin American campaign coordinator of Code Pink, joining us from La Paz, Bolivia, where he's been leading Code Pink's election observation team all week. Again, the stunning news out of Bolivia right now, an outright victory for the ousted Bolivian president Evo Morales's MAS party. Um, now the president-elect that has been conceded by both sides is Luis Arce.